Five years ago, when Republicans were last in control of the House of Representatives, they used the opportunity to roll back banking regulations put into place after the 2008 financial crisis. As that bill was making its way through Congress, a California professor named Katie Porter tweeted her concerns, writing that it, quote, puts consumers and our economy at risk and shows just how much power Wall Street banks, powerful special interests, and their high-priced lobbyists have in Washington. The bill passed, but Porter went on to win a seat in Congress, and she is now fighting to get that bill overturned. Congresswoman Katie Porter of California, the ranking member on the House Oversight Subcommittee on Health Care and Financial Services, who is also running for Senate next year, joins me now. Congresswoman, it's great to have you uh, back on the program. It's good to see you. So talk to me about the, the collapse here of SVB. Um, it ranks as the second largest bank failure in the U.S., right behind Washington Mutual back in 2008, uh, just ahead of Signature Bank, which also just happened a few days ago. What is going on here? Well, this comes from a failure to appropriately regulate big banks. And we had, after Dodd-Frank, appropriate regulations in place for exactly this size of bank, big. And lo and behold, no more than Dodd-Frank passed, then people started coming around to politicians' offices, offering them corporate pack checks and lobbying them to repeal those regulations. And we had Democrats and Republicans join in 2018 to repeal the very capital holding requirements that create a cushion for this exact size of bank. So for me to hear colleagues later when this was happening this weekend say this was unbelievable and how could this happen was frustrating to say the least. This is what happens when we have politicians who cater to Wall Street instead of working families. This morning, I'm sure you saw President Biden uh, addressing the country, assuring people their deposits are safe, that taxpayers are not on the hook for the banks. How confident are you of that assessment? Well, I have no doubt that that is what President Biden hopes happens, and that is the intent here. But I think we've seen before with these kinds of programs that the devil is really in the details. And there are some concerning aspects of how this is being rolled out. One of the things we did with the Dodd-Frank Act after um, the financial, the last financial crisis was we said, look, assets have to be marked to market. They have to be, you have to value them at what they're actually worth. And what the Federal Reserve is doing with this lending program is saying, we'll treat your collateral at par value rather than what it's really worth today. So I, I, I understand that when you get into a bank failure, there are no good solutions. That's exactly why we can't let this keep happening. We have Do to you... repeal the regulation that Trump and Congress passed in 2018 to get us back to a place where we have cushions, where we don't put ourselves where there are no good choices. So you, you, you began to answer the question I was just about to ask you, which is, do you think repealing the, the 2018 deregulation law will be sufficient protection against this kind of thing going forward? Or is there something else that needs to be done on top of, uh, of repealing it? Well, there are definitely other questions here, but let me be clear. I'm introducing legislation to repeal that 2018 law. It was bad then. I said it was bad then, and I was not alone. There were other folks, including Elizabeth Warren, who pushed against this, but Wall Street's lobby in Washington is simply too powerful, and they were able to get not just Republicans, but I think almost 50 Democrats between the House and the Senate to sign on to this. So I, I do think repealing the law is a good start, but I don't think it's enough. I I think there are real questions about how we think about stopping runs on banks in a digital world. We sort of have analog banking law for a digital economy. And I, I think we, ha we saw that this sort of close the bank on a Friday, reopen it on a Monday, which is sort of the very traditional model, simply doesn't work where people have online banking and they can, they can work over the weekend and remove money um, and organize kind of continual withdrawals throughout the weekend. So I think the Federal Reserve and FDIC need to think about how we're going to modernize to deal with this sort of digital bank run, which is really what we have here today. I'm glad you brought that up because obviously the fear is spreading. And you saw that over the weekend with First Republic stock dropping uh, so significantly, more than 60 percent. You've got other uh, banking stocks dropping as well. Uh, you need Congress in a situation like this. You need the entire government to move quickly to just kind of boost confidence and get confidence back into the system. But the question is, 
How does Congress or the administration uh, do something immediately to reassure people about their money in those banks? Well, I think that's part of the logic behind this announcement that all the depositors will be fully protected as we're trying to reassure people and send a signal that the U.S. government understands what's at stake here and what needs to, what what, we, what the dangers are of allowing this to continue. I, I do want to say that this gives an opportunity now for um, the FDIC to start doing more evaluations of these of these large but not ginormous. That's really what they are. They're huge but not ginormous banks, um, and to try to make sure that we don't have this same problem at other financial institutions. Look, let's be really clear. What happened here was could have been prevented by good regulation. It also could have been prevented by the executives and directors and management of Silicon Valley Bank, not forgetting the basic fundamental of finance, which is that interest rates can go in only two directions, up and down. And it's their failure to think about that because they were so focused on their bottom line that led to this run on the bank. Should this bank be allowed to fail? Well, so the Federal Reserve has already, I mean, we've already answered that question, which is no. That was the decision that was rolled out on Sunday evening and this morning that we're going to um, protect depositors, whether ultimately it all gets moved to another bank and this bank goes out of business. I think that's not the focus. The focus should be on how do we get here? How do we prevent the next bank from getting here? How do we build regulation to have a durable economy? So often when my colleagues vote for these kinds of deregulation bills, they explain their votes by saying they are pro-business. I want to be clear, there is nothing pro-business about a bank failure. And we have to start chipping away at this because it's not just this law and this moment with Silicon Valley Bank. It's an entire mindset about what it means to have oh, a strong economy and what those fights are and what side of those fights you should be on that I think is, is putting our whole economy at risk today and going forward. We are closely watching a case that would upend abortion pill access across the country, including in states where abortion is still legal. The case was brought by a group of anti-abortion organizations. It seeks to overturn the Food and Drug Administration's approval of a medication commonly used for abortion. And in a highly unusual move, the judge tried to delay notifying the public about the first hearing in the case. As Katie Benner reported for The New York Times, Judge Matthew Kaczmarek issued or at least asked lawyers not to disclose the hearing scheduled for this Wednesday. Now, after that report, the judge initially, uh, the judge rather finally issued an order today publicly scheduling the date of the hearing. And New York Times Justice Department reporter Katie Benner joins me now. Katie, it's good to see you again. So uh, the plaintiffs here are asking the judge uh, for a preliminary injunction. If that were granted, would that mean the FDA couldn't dispense this, abor this abortion medication in all 50 states? Yes, correct. So when preliminary injunctions are issued, oftentimes it will prevent something from happening all across the country while the hearing proceeds. In this case, it would prevent the sale of a commonly used abortion drug um, from being used in states across the country, whether or not abortion is banned in those places. You, in your piece, also uh, write the judge said that uh, court staff had faced security issues, including death threats, and that the measure was intended to keep the court proceedings safe. Is that a reasonable argument for keeping the hearing concealed? I mean, this case could potentially impose the most far-reaching limit on abortion access since mm -hmm. Roe uh, was struck down. So I don't want to second guess what the judge said on that private call. You know, I'm, I cannot be in his head. I can say that, of course, the issue of abortion is extremely contentious in the, in the United States. It doesn't surprise me that somebody would worry about safety issues or threats. That's why we have U.S. Marshals at courthouses. But I will just say that for the federal government, it really put lawyers in a quandary because for them, they feel that unless a case is filed under seal, there's a big national security risk to it. It could harm the United States' standing in the, around the globe. It could endanger citizens. Uh, they, they really do not want things under seal and they don't want things hidden. Now, interestingly, the judge did not order this. He said, please do this as a courtesy. He asked people to keep this under wraps. He didn't make it an official order, however, and now it has been scheduled. 
Let me ask you about this judge here for a moment. The Washington Post recently wrote uh, Kazmarek, who ascended to the federal bench from the conservative legal group First Liberty Institute, has defended his ability to be impartial in his work as a judge. Uh, nonetheless, many of his recent decisions have been wins for the right, including one that struck down new Biden administration protections for transgender people, another that forced thousands of asylum seekers to return to Mexico while they awaited processing. Can you t tell us more about what you have learned in your reporting about Judge Kaczmarek? You know, to everything you just said about Judge Kaczmarek is what's most commonly known about him. He is, you know, he is a, a well-known scholar, legal scholar in the in the conservative movement. What's one? Of, there are many things that are interesting about this case coming before Judge Kaczmarek. One, it echoes things that happened during the Obama administration. We saw a lot of cases go into states like Texas because then they would go to the Fifth Circuit, which tended to lean more conservative. And when people did not like Obama's policies, they would they would they would initiate lawsuits that would go through that circuit. This is sort of similar to what we saw during the Obama era. Judge Kaczmarek, though, he is the he is the judge in Amarillo, Texas. And we see that one of the groups, one of the plaintiffs in this case, Alliance, they are headquartered in Amarillo, but they don't have a big presence there. Most of their work is done outside of that mm. town. However, they are headquartered there, and that is why the case was brought there. I think some people who are watching this might be wondering how an FDA-approved drug uh, that has been used for over 20 years, how is it possible to challenge the safety of a drug that has been widely used for so long now? Yeah, of course. So let's go through the, the basic, basic arguments for the plaintiffs. They're saying this drug never should have been approved. It, there, there was not enough consideration given to how it would affect younger people. Of course, what the FDA and other interveners are saying is this has been on the market, to your point, for more than 20 years. If we thought there were significant safety issues, they would have arisen. Now, we don't know how the judge will decide. You know, there's a, there's a chance that he ultimately agrees with the plaintiffs. But it's hard to say that this will stop medication abortions in the United States of America. One, there's a second drug that's not at the heart of this lawsuit that is also used for medical abortions. And two, these are pills that are now more and more commonly being delivered from other countries into the, into the United States, even into states where abortion is illegal. We'll see how, uh, how this plays out Wednesday morning. Katie Benner, thank you so much. Great, uh, greatly appreciate your insights and your reporting on this. So the pilgrimages to Iowa are already underway. Donald Trump is in Davenport tonight. Ron DeSantis in the very same city just last Friday. They are both scoring about the same favorability rating with Republicans in Iowa. But Trump still leads nationally. And despite the best efforts of Fox, who have been really, really, really trying to make DeSantis a thing in this country, rolling out a glowing profile of the Florida governor and even a softball interview. If not this time to run for president, would you think at some time it's safe to say that that would be one of your goals? I would I would only I would only do stuff if I thought there was a rationale for me to accomplish things on behalf of the people. So it's all substance driven about whether I could serve or not serve in a variety of capacities. But I'll tell you, you know, the, as governor and if you're a determined executive, you know, you can make things happen, and we've done that in Florida. When can we expect the big announcement? <laughs> Depends how good we do in this legislative session. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Governor. All right, joining me here at the table to talk about what is going on on the 2024 Republican race for president, Jelani Cobb, the dean of the Columbia University School of Journalism and a staff writer for The New Yorker, Tim O'Brien, the senior executive editor for Bloomberg Opinion and the author of Trump Nation, The Art of Being the Donald. Gentlemen, thank you both uh, for joining us. Um, Jelani, I'll start with you here. Uh, <laughs> Trump is now going after Ron DeSantis. Big, big surprise to no one in this country who thought this race was going to get at some point have him, even though he's not officially in there. He's been calling him Ron DeSanctimonious, accusing right. him of manufacturing uh, beef with Disney to score culture war points. How resonant do you think that is going to be? Is that a factor? Well, I mean, I don't know how that plays in that particular crowd. I mean, but it, there's an air of this being like the magician doing the trick for the second time. Mm. You know, in 2016, when you saw that huge field uh, of Republicans who were on stage, uh, there was one thing that they all had in common, which was that they had never been insulted uh, to their faces. Uh, they had never been, I mean, 
uh, Ted Cruz's father being implicated in the, the Kennedy assassination, all sorts of outlandish things that were pure tabloid kind of ridicule um, and absurdity, but it worked. Uh, it's a little bit harder to, to sell that trick the same t again the, the second time around, though. Interesting. Uh, especially when you have an actual track record and people can call you on things you did or didn't get done. Uh, Tim, so Trump is still the front runner. Um, is this tactic likely to have an impact on uh, voters? And is is there a way forward for Ron DeSantis in this race if Donald Trump continues on this path? Well, I think it'll always have an impact with his base because they love the theatrics. Donald Trump is a performance artist. He's not a policy-driven politician, to say the least. And, and, and his base heats that up. The, the problem for the Republicans and Trump is that they've lost moderate voters, they've lost the middle and swing voters. And those voters didn't know Trump in 2016. They knew him by 2020, and they know him now. And he's done nothing at all to sort of try to create a bridge from this, you know, 25 to 30 percent of the MAGA wing of the Republican Party to build that into an authentic national coalition. The party, I think, wants DeSantis. Mm. The problem is every other Republican doesn't have any traction with that 30 percent. So every time you see Trump or DeSantis talking about this, it's essentially hostage videos because, <laughs> because they don't know a way out yet. And, and I think they're in trouble with that.